Good morning and welcome to our worship service here at First Pres. We're delighted to have you here with us and especially if you're a guest. I want to make sure that you have a bulletin. This will guide you through the service. So if you need a bulletin, raise your hand and one of the ushers will uh, get one to you. And also in the pew rack in front of you is this card. If you're a visitor, we ask that you would fill it out, put it in the offering plate so that we might be in touch with you. and answer any questions that you might have about the Christian faith or the church. And on the back side of the card is space for prayer requests. It's our privilege and honor as pastors to be praying for you every Monday. And so if you would also put your prayer requests there and that in the offering plate, uh, we'd be privileged to be praying for you. A few announcements. Again, in your flyer here, there are many more. I'd just like to touch upon a few. First of all, today's Promotion Sunday in our rhythm of life here. Uh, the children have moved up to new classes. And then also, many of our college graduates, our, our high school graduates, are going to be going off to college in the next few weeks. So if you are a new college uh, freshman, and uh, we would like to invite you to go to the session room immediately after the service. We'd love to pray for you. We'd love to give you a book to strengthen your faith. And we do have food. So uh, please join us, and again, uh, pastors and you staff and others will be there to uh, wish you well and pray for you. And finally, we have the Lord's Supper tonight. This is a sacrament of the church which strengthens our souls, reminds us of the gospel and our need for Christ. Now let us use the meditation to prepare our hearts for worship. It is God's grace that calls us into worship. We'll use Isaiah 33 as the call to worship. I invite you to stand, please. Lord, be gracious to us. We long for you. The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. 
He will fill Zion with his justice and righteousness. The Lord is a rich store of salvation and wisdom and knowledge. For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver, the Lord is our king. It is he who will save us. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Let us worship God. Heavenly Father, the hymn writer has said, God rules on high, almighty to save, and reminds us that the praises of Jesus the angels proclaim. Holy Spirit, help us to understand these truths, not only with our minds, but our hearts, and in so doing, love Jesus even more. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Christians, what do you believe? maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, before us, for our salvation, came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made a man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, the third day he rose again, according to the Scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sin. And we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen.
Our reading from the Psalms this morning is Psalm 146. In the Pew Bible, and the, it can be found on page 980. This is the Word of God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Do not put your trust in princes, immortal men who cannot save. When their spirit departs, they return to the ground. On that very day, their plans come to nothing. Blessed is he whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, the Lord who remains faithful forever. He upholds the cause of the oppressed and gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets prisoners free The Lord gives sight to the blind. The Lord lifts up those who are bowed down. The Lord loves the righteous. The Lord watches over the alien and sustains the fatherless and the widow. But he frustrates the ways of the wicked. The Lord reigns forever, your God, O Zion, for all generations. Praise the Lord. The grass withers and the flowers fall. Let's now take few moments to personally confess our sins. I invite you to kneel if you're able as we think about the Holy God. And let us confess together our sins using the words found on page six of your bulletin. Heavenly Father, we humbly confess that we are an anxious, fearful people. We do not trust you as we should, and often try to control our circumstances to prevent hardship and pain. We are slow to seek you in prayer, weak in perseverance, quick to forget faithfulness of your power and providence. We try to manipulate and scheme instead of resting in your promises and remembering your love. Forgive us for the folly of self-preservation and self-trust. Forgive us for your goodness. Forgive us for being conformed to this world and for placing our trust in possessions, power, and the wisdom of man. Renew our minds and hearts, that we might walk by faith and not by sight. By your mercy, keep us steadfastly devoted to Christ, and cause us to endure to the end. Hear now the words that assure us of pardoning grace. Praise await you, our God in Zion. To you our vows will be fulfilled. You who answer prayer, to you all people will come. When we were overwhelmed by sins, you forgave our transgressions. Blessed are those you choose and bring near to live in your courts. We are filled with the good things of your house, of your holy temple. Would you please stand as we continue in prayer. I invite you to continue with me in prayer. Father, you tell us, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You say, come, when we are afraid, you say, come. When we are weary, you say, come. Or when we lack wisdom, you say, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all men generously and without reproach. We're invited to come. We're commanded to come. Lord, you give us comfort and rest when we come. May this be our practice, not only in public worship, 
day by day, moment by moment. Teach us to cast our anxieties upon you, knowing that you care for us. And Father, we do bring before you your mission, your mission through this church, your mission to the world. We do pray for our children and we thank you on Promotion Sunday that you've brought families here and that we're commanded to teach them, to disciple them, to nurture them, to train them. We thank you for college students, those that will be returning soon and those that will be going off for the first time. Lord, as they go back to college, may they sense your commission as followers of Jesus Christ, allegiance to you first and foremost, and may they extend love and welcome in Jesus' name to all they come in contact with. We thank you, Father, for the many mission trips that are going on right now. We do pray for the medical campus outreach trip that's left for Cusco, Peru, for the Allied Health leadership there with Mark LeDuc and Caitlin McNair. We do pray for Luke Nide as he was on that trip. And we pray for the MCO dental trip that will leave this afternoon for Romania, for the 50 dental students and doctors, for Brian Martin as he leads, Chandler Holgate as well. We pray for Jill Stafford who's in Kenya with the medical team. We ask you to use their work, Father, not only to advance the gospel, but to strengthen those who serve. We pray that for Clark Boutwell, our missionary of the week, as she works with Young Life in Texas, but she strengthens and serves the work of Young Life throughout Latin America. Be near to her, use her in the lives of teenagers and their families, both in Texas as well as the ministry of Young Life in Latin America. We pray for her financial needs as well. We pray for our sick. We pray that you'd be, be near Celeste Boudreaux, Jim Downing, who are recovering from surgery. Be near those who are battling illness and cancer. We continue to pray for Carolyn Tremere, Nancy Matsinger, Renee Foss, Mildred Coleman, Julia Joyner, Patty Edenfield, Dakota Mack, Julie McDonnell, Sharon Stork, Jonathan Bice, Ronnie Barnes and Leslie Bogdanow. Thank you for the promise that we have in Jesus that all our prayers are heard because Jesus is at your right hand, because Jesus is our intercessor and our advocate. And we pray these in the powerful name of Christ, using the words that he taught his disciples to use when we pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please be seated.
dwell with my soul because we are at peace with God. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Please take a moment to share that peace. seated. Turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 18. This is the last Sunday for many college students who will be re returning to their campuses and for some who will be going off the next week or two for the first time, pastors and youth staff do want to invite all college students to the session room just briefly after the service. We want to pray with you, give you some information. We do have a gift for you. Now, spoiler alert, college student, it's not a Starbucks gift card, but I think the gift will be welcomed and helpful. We'd like to share it with you. A lot of what we want to do is let you know we want to stay connected to you while you're off at school and how we have some ideas about how we can do that. This morning, the text, as usual, with Jesus' words, it digs deep into our hearts. 
really examines what we determine in our hearts that is treasure. We sang about Jesus as our treasure, but we're going to look at what it means to be called away from our treasures and called into following Jesus and seeing him as our treasure. We'll see about one young man who came to Jesus asking Jesus to unscramble all the things that were going on in his heart and make sense out of his life. He recognized that he needed a spiritual path and he's seeking for direction. You might be here this morning trying to unscramble things that are going on in your life and make sense out of them. You are at the right place. But sadly, I'll tell you that this man, after hearing Jesus' words, turned away and did not listen and did not follow. We need to pray right now, and I would ask you to pray and ask God to allow you to hear his words so that you might take Jesus' words in, treasure them, and they might have a transforming effect on your heart. Let's pray together before we start. Father, would you, by your Spirit, speak to us, teach us what Jesus wants us to know about following him. Father, we know that many of us here have said yes to following Jesus. Teach us what it means to follow farther. For those that have never professed faith in Jesus, your word says, with man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Would you give the gift of salvation? Open blind eyes, make hearts receptive. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, amen. Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 18, and I'll read through verse 33. A certain ruler asked him, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not murder, do not steal, do not give false testimony, honor your father and mother. All these I have kept since I was a boy, he said. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, you still lack one thing. Sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. When he heard this, he became very sad because he was a man of great wealth. Jesus looked at him and said, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this asked, who then can be saved? Jesus replied, what is impossible with men is possible with God. Peter said to him, we have left all we had to follow you. I tell you the truth, Jesus said to them, no one who has left home or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Jesus took the 12 aside and told them, we are going to Jerusalem and everything that is written by the prophets about the Son of Man will be fulfilled. He will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him, insult him, spit on him, flog him and kill him. On the third day, he will rise again. This is the word of God. Thanks be to thee, O God. Once again, Jesus is talking about money in the kingdom. Here, Mark tells us that a man comes up to Jesus and falls at his feet. We assume that he is sincere. Matthew tells us that he was a young man, prominent and impressive that he had such a position of influence at such a young age. Luke tells us he was a ruler, probably a uh, civil ruler, magistrate, probably not a religious ruler, though he might have been. But all the Gospels tell us this, 
This man was rich. And Jesus has been speaking to the rich. We know in Luke 6, he says, woe to you who are rich. And we know that he's given parables to those who trust in riches and do not store up for themselves treasures in heaven. So before we look more deeply at this man's life, just a few comments about wealth, riches, and the kingdom. First, invariably most Christians when they read this story begin to think of two to three other people that Jesus must be talking to and not to them. None of us believes that Jesus would be addressing us as rich and that's a problem. It's a problem because Jesus is speaking to us. Also the Bible is very clear that our relationship with money impacts our relationship with God positively or negatively. All of us have a relationship with money and if we have lots of money it's a temptation to be prideful or reckless. If we don't have as much money as we want, there's a temptation to be envious or to be angry and bitter, to judge people whether we have or whether we don't have. So relationship with money has an impact on your relationship with God. I think we can say that Jesus is taught and the epistles have taught us that money is not our ultimate problem. It does say the love of money is the root of all evil, but money is not our ultimate problem. But money does make all of our problems more complex and more complicated. And a wrong relationship with money can cause our problems to become more strained and difficult. Last thing I'll mention that we see in the text and in these texts is that caring for the poor is not just a political or social issue. From the Old Testament throughout Jesus' ministry and the New Testament writers in church history, Christians understood that caring for the poor was all a part of the church's responsibility to love the world in the name of Christ. Here we talk in looking at your definition of life. Your definition of life is what you treasure and that which you treasure you find satisfaction. That which you treasure, you find security. That which you treasure, you look for significance. And Jesus says, we need to evaluate our relationship with money and how it affects our treasure of God. So what was the rich young ruler's approach? The sentence is actually somewhat contradictory. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life. It's a contradiction of sorts. You can tell that he's confused because he starts with what must I do? That's really referencing to what you might think of as a paycheck. What must I do to earn God's favor? But then he says, in order to inherit eternal life, an inheritance is something that you receive that you don't deserve. It's a gift from someone else. So his approach seems to be that he's looking for some advice here. And I think that's not unusual as people find themselves trying to unscramble the mess that they find themselves in, the confusion that they face in their life. They want some advice. He seems to be seeking advice. Notice that Luke, as well as Jesus, is contrasting these little children in verse 17 that are entering the kingdom and this wealthy man in verse 24, where Jesus says it's hard for him to enter the kingdom. The issue is entering the kingdom and he's seeking some advice. But advice is like an accessory. <laughs> it's something that might make the travel a little nicer, but it's not a necessary feature. Seems as if this man is saying, what do I need to add to my life in order to improve my status? He's looking for advice. He's compartmentalizing his Christian life. And this is a temptation. It's a temptation for college students. I've seen this through the years. College students who've grown up in uh, the church or Christian home, they recognize that I have my academics and I have my social life and I have 
maybe my uh, exercise and taking care of myself physically, I need to compartmentalize. I need a spiritual life. It's really just viewing Jesus as someone who is an advisor, someone who can improve your situation. It may be that he was seeking advice. It may be that he was seeking achievement. He asked the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus' response is different than most responses that we see in the Gospels. Jesus tells him, keep the commandments. And he lists out those commandments that are related to loving your neighbor. He lists out adultery, stealing, lying, honoring your father and mother. Those that we would call the second table of the law. And he says, well, I've kept those. And... Uh, what more do I need to do? Well, Jesus presses in and he pushes on one issue. He says, then sell all your possessions and give to the poor. Then follow me and you will find treasure in heaven. Jesus is pressing in on the first commandment, the first commandment to have no other gods before you. Jesus is saying, Oh, really? <laughs> you want to achieve eternal life? Well, love God with all your heart. Love God with all your mind. Love God with all your strength. Love God with all your life. That's the first and greatest commandment. But if we love God with all our mind, we'd never think anything wrong. If we love God with all our heart, we'd never want anything wrong. If we love God with all our strength, we'd never do anything wrong. We'd be a perfect person. Jesus is helping this young man realize you cannot achieve eternal life. It can only be received. And you're not good enough. Even when he asked Jesus, good teacher, Jesus wants to know, are you calling me Messiah? Only God's goodness can remedy our situation. And we can receive eternal life by trusting in what Jesus has done, or we can seek to achieve by what we're doing. I do find it interesting here that Jesus presses in on this one thing. It's the language that he uses, it's interesting. He says, one thing that you're still lacking. I could imagine the conversation maybe going this way. Lord, what must I do? I've left all. Jesus says, well, there is one thing. And then I could hear the man saying, well, Lord, let me tell you about all the things, everything that I've left. But Jesus is saying, I'm really only interested in talking to you about the one thing. Oh, Lord, but what about all of these other things? No, it's just the one thing. For you, if you haven't let go of the one thing, you may not have let, let go of anything. You can't claim everything if there's the one thing that you're holding on to. Jesus is calling this man to allegiance. He's commanding him to follow and he's commanding him to sell his possessions. Those are the two verbs that Jesus calls him to action on. Sell your possessions is a secondary tense. Follow me is a primary tense. Nowhere in the other gospels, any of the other gospels, have we seen Jesus saying in order to have eternal life, you have to sell all your possessions. In Luke 5, when he called Matthew to follow him, he didn't require him to sell all his possessions. In Luke 19, Zacchaeus is called to follow Jesus and he's not required to sell all of his possessions. But Jesus is pressing in on this one thing. Have you let go? <laughs> have you loved God with all your heart? Do you have allegiance to him? That's what it means to follow. It means to let go. Maybe a question or two for you this morning about letting go. Is there anything in your life this morning that you would say, this is off limits to you, Lord. I will follow you but this one thing I can't let go of. Or is there anything in your life 
that you can't thank God for, even if it's been taken away. That one thing is where Jesus wants to meet you. That one thing of resistance that you say, I will follow you, Lord, but that one thing is the place where Jesus wants you to cling to him. Because the gospel is not just about surrender and letting go. It's about turning and trusting in Christ and clinging to him and taking him as our own. Listen to what Elizabeth Elliot says. There is no ongoing spiritual life without the process of letting go. At the precise point where we refuse to let go, growth for us stops. If we hold tightly to anything that has been given to us and we're unwilling to let go, we're unwilling to give this over to the giver of life itself, we're cut off from the life that we long for. The truth is whatever we are given is ours to thank him. Whatever we are given is ours to offer back to him. Whatever we are given is ours to relinquish and lose. It is ours to let go of that we might be filled with his glory. First and foremost, the call to follow Jesus is a call to leave and to let go. But it's also a call to cling. Christianity, different from all other religions, is a religion of relationship. And Jesus calls us to cling to him. In the 77 times in the Gospels where this phrase, follow, is, is used, almost all of the times, Jesus uses that word and it's followed by the word me. He doesn't say follow an ideal, follow a set of moral teachings. Jesus says, follow me. Luke 9, 23, if any man wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. The call to discipleship is a call to cling to him. We studied Luke 10 when Jesus visited Martha and Mary and Martha became very angry that her sister Mary would not help her with the preparations. And she came to ask Jesus to rebuke Mary for not helping. Mary, you know, was sitting at Jesus' feet. And Jesus said to Martha, 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 you're bothered, you're busy by so many things. And really only one thing is necessary. Only one thing is needful. Mary has chosen the good part. It will not be taken from her. She's clinging to me. She's let go of all these things that we say are so important. She's treasuring me. And she's experiencing what it means to follow me. Leaving, letting go, clinging, but also joining. In Matthew 4, where Jesus called the disciples to follow, he said, follow me. I will make you fishers of men. Come join my mission. The mission of Jesus is advanced by those who live the lifestyle of a disciple. Your call to advance the mission is a call to follow Jesus farther. Not necessary to do something heroic or great for the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Your call is to follow Jesus farther. It's a call to join him to store up treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves cannot break in and steal. Mark tells us that when Jesus called this man to leave all and follow, he first loved him. When Jesus calls us away from those things that enslave us, it's a call of love. It's a call to his heart. His authority and his demand for allegiance is a call to love. How do we move our lives? How do we move our lives to the point where we gladly accept the call of Jesus? We're not fearful. We're not hesitant. 
This text reminds us Jesus at any time can put his finger on anything in our lives and say, let go of that. Jesus may have already done that in your life. He may have taken things or others may have taken things that Jesus allowed for them to take. And he said, it's time. It's no longer yours to manage. It's no longer yours to be in control of. You know, our, our identity is defined as what we are living for. But our self-worth is how we feel about how we're doing. As Jesus put his finger on something and said, my allegiance demands that you let go. Where do we find the strength and the assurance? He doesn't have to give us an explanation for anything that he says it's time. Well, I think the key is found in verses 31 through 33. Before we read that, don't miss, don't miss that phrase. With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. That's the connection between the camel going through the eye of the needle. That's what he's talking about there. We're talking about a spiritual transformation that takes place that God gives to us. If you're struggling to let go of an issue in your life, I'll tell you what you need to do. You need to say, God, give me the strength. Give me the hope. You need to turn to him and ask for grace. With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. God, make me willing. God, change my heart. Where's the assurance, though, that if we let go, he will catch us. He will provide for us. Look in verses 31 through 33. It says that he pulled the disciples aside. This is very important. He says, we are going to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be handed over to the Gentiles. They will mock him. They will insult him. They will spit on him. They will flog him. They will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise again. Jesus is telling the disciples, there will be treasure in heaven waiting for you because I will die for you. <laughs> I will distance myself from the throne of God and my father's relationship and I will take on the death that you deserve. I will treasure you. I will provide what you could never provide and my call for you to trust me is a call for you to experience treasure in heaven. I am your treasure and I treasure you. Jesus calls, follow me, find me as your treasure. Last year, one of my mentors passed away, went to be with the Lord. He was 104 years of age. And every time I got to spend with him was a gift and a treat. He lived in Colorado, so I didn't spend a lot of time with him. But we'd talk on the phone occasionally. I would go out and visit with him. One time when I was meeting with him, he said, uh, I said, tell me some of the lessons you've learned here in your mature age. He said, well, he said, when about when I was middle age, and I said, I'm not sure where you count middle on that, but he said, when I was middle age, maybe your age, he said, I began to recognize that from now on in my life, losses were going to outpace gains in my experience. He said, I was beginning to orient myself to this reality that losses were going to outpace gains, and the truth is, Finishing well in following Jesus is finding joy, as much joy in the losses as I do in the gains. I was stunned. I couldn't stop thinking about that. To treasure Jesus in such a way that my joy is equal in losses as it is in gains is to know what it means to be known by Jesus. What about you? I'm troubled at times with that thought <laughs> that my life on this earth is going to be more known in these days ahead 
by losses than gains. Why would Jesus demand that we follow him in that way? I asked that question to my mentor and he said, I think that what we need to do as we move closer to heaven is to recognize our insignificance. We're not as important as we think that we are. We're not as important to the kingdom of God. We're not as important to those that are on the earth. Really, there's a level of insignificance we need to live in. But also, he said, not only my level of insignificance, but also a recognition. He's preparing me and making me ready for heaven. He's preparing my heart to treasure Jesus above all earthly things. What if you don't have much faith this morning to let go of the things that Jesus might be asking you to let go of? I want to encourage you with a story of Moses. You know that Moses was a man of shame after he had killed a man, after he had lost favor with his kinsmen, the Jews, after his Egyptian brothers had disowned him as well, the Pharaoh, and he had fled Egypt. He had started over again, started a new occupation as a shepherd, and he was walking through the land and he saw a burning bush. And you recall that he had a face-to-face encounter and God told him, I've seen the afflictions of my people. I've heard their cries and I've come down to rescue them and I will send you. This is Exodus chapter three. You recall Moses began to make excuses. Oh, no, 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 I have nothing to offer. You don't wanna send me, I'm bankrupt. (laughs) I am empty. (laughs) I can't speak, I have no eloquent way to talk to the Egyptians. I've lost any sense of language or communication. He said, I wouldn't know what to tell people. I'm not theologically prepared. I don't know your name. I wouldn't know how to talk to them about who you are. God said, I'll send you, Abr- I'll send you Aaron. He'll go along with you. Moses made excuse after excuse after excuse. Finally, God said, what is in your hand? And it was his shepherd's rod. That shepherd's rod he'd used to guide and direct the sheep that were wandering. He'd use that to protect against any predators. God told Moses, throw down that rod. And he threw it down and it became a serpent. That was significant for Moses to see because the Egyptian Pharaoh, the presence of evil on the earth was a cobra. He was a snake of all snakes. And God said, you're gonna need my power You're gonna need my consecrated power, but I want you to know I will go with you and my power will go with you. And then God told him, pick up that serpent. And he picked it up by the tail and it became a rod again. In Exodus four, it tells us that Moses then followed. He took his family, he took his livestock, but in Exodus 4.20, it says this, and he took the rod of God. No longer was that Moses' rod, It was God's rod, and it was sanctified, it was consecrated. It had power over evil because God had received it from Moses' hand. Don't say you have very little to offer. Whatever you have, God says, let it go, throw it down, and he will consecrate it. He will use it for his purposes. You know, we don't know if The rich young ruler have began to make plans to let go of his wealth if God, if Jesus would have said to him, well, hang on to it anyway. I wanted to see where your heart was on this. We know that God did that with Abraham when he told him to sacrifice Isaac. We don't know that. But what he says is following me means being willing to let it go, to throw it down and to release it for my purposes. You know, recently I was speaking to a pastor, friend of mine, another city, and at 
times he was sharing his struggles and joys and one of the things he said is, you know, I'm just weary at times. When my people walk out of the service, I feel like what they're thinking is, what did I get out of the service today? Was the music something that inspired me? Was the sermon great? What did I get out of the sermon? He said, it just really discourages me as a pastor. Well, the conversation ended, it moved on to other topics, but I've been thinking about that comment, and as I was studying this passage this week, I thought, you know what a disciple's posture should be every Sunday? What am I going to leave today? What's getting out of me today, having been in Jesus' presence? What am I going to let go of joyfully? Because I have been touched by Jesus' love. That's what we're called to do in following Jesus. If any man wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Sell all your possessions, give to the poor and you will find treasure in heaven and come and follow me. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's pray together. Jesus, when Paul tells us whatever was gained to me, I count as loss for the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Would you teach us the joy of loss? Would you teach us the gain of losing? Would you teach us the beauty of following you? I pray especially for our college students that are going to be facing challenges on the campuses, temptations as they're away from home and away from their church, may their greatest desire be that they want to follow you and leaving and clinging and joining you in what you're doing is their highest joy. I pray for each person here today, Father, if there's anyone here that has not said no to self and yes to Jesus, may today be the day of salvation. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
want you to raise your hands and receive God's benediction. Now, believer in Christ, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be and abide with you now and forevermore. Go in that peace. Amen.